of the blue, he said, oh, how's it going? A bit of small talk. And then he said, we're not signing this deal. And I said, well, why? And he said, because I know what Stevie's like. If we sign this deal, he'll spend all his money on it, and I'm not letting that happen. The I band, heard she was hairdressing. Yeah, you she know, was. Yeah. I mean, you, you've got Talk Sport up here. Yeah. She used to cut Jim White's hair <laughs> in Glasgow. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Virgin Radio 80s Plus. Jeff Young, hello. <laughs> Steve, it's good to see you. So good to see you again. Um, we kind of worked together briefly about 20 years ago when you were at a radio station called Capital. Absolutely. I think I made you a few cups of tea. You might well have done. Um, and also, I'm going to start off with the embarrassing stuff, but you are a big reason why I'm sat here. Well, that's very kind of you, you to know, put it mildly. Listening to your, uh, your national radio show, the first national dance show and I think I caught on to Big B around kind of 88, 89 yeah, yeah. I was like who is this guy playing all this like brand new stuff that's not going to be released you know it was such a thrill as a 13, 14 year old yeah. to um, to learn so much about music through you so thank you for coming in well no that's a pleasure and um, we're going to start with your list of songs so right at the beginning is uh, Japan Quiet Life tell me about how you've um, ha- how you got this list together well, basically, I, I looked at um, the 80s in general and my career and where it went. And so I've chosen a list where I've kind of got anecdotes about all the songs. Some of them uh, are very much work related to what I was doing at the time. And the rest are just the, the couple are just favourites, basically. Yeah. yeah, there's some great, um, there's a great mix of tunes here. So we start yeah. with Japan. Yeah. Let's go straight to it. What's the importance of this song? Well, when I first got. Uh, my first record company job in October 81. I was very much a soul music DJ and I was expected to kind of promote and plug um, black music to the clubs. But because I was in a major record company, they had a whole raft of alternative bands that were being played at alternative club nights, student nights and stuff. So for the first time ever, I found myself um, rolling around clubs in Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, that were either student nights or specialists, what they would call alternative nights. And although I knew about most of the artists that were being played, you know, it was the Human League, Soft Cell, Early ABC, all that kind of stuff, um, there there were other bands that I knew about, but I didn't know about the music. And one of them was Japan. And even though Quiet Life came out in 1980, a couple of years later, it was still a massive tune at all of those nights. And uh, I always love Quiet Life. And it, this song would seem, after I hadn't heard it for so long, it's a bit like, I mean, I was quite young when this song came out, but was it, am I right in thinking that it was the end of the kind of glam, the glam rock punk thing? Yeah, And yeah. almost the start of the bleakness of the beginning of the 80s. It's got a proper mood to it, this track. Yeah, yeah, it has. And um, as they progressed and eventually released Tin Drum, their whole sound had become much more rounded and a little bit cooler, actually. And Tin Drum ended up being one of my favourite albums of the 80s as well. But uh, David Sylvie and the whole band were real characters, great image. Um, it was, it was a, a perfect play for them. Next track is one of the most pivotal bands, their 80s through, the Tears for Fears. Yeah. Well, Tears for Fears, again, was uh, on the label that I was working for. And um, I was also trying to get their records played at these alternative club nights. And we released a couple of singles that hadn't really done the business. And then the third single we released from their album was Mad World. Mm. And it was doing okay. And then when we got to about number 17, they went on top of the pops. And the rest, as they say, is history. That that performance broke them, did it? Oh, absolutely. You know, the phones exploded the following day. And um, it really was a massive turning point for them. It's interesting. Lots of people will recognise your voice and know your name from Big Beat but just to recap you were working for what were you doing at record companies which record company was it just tell me basically the first record company I worked for was called Phonogram they uh, evolved over time and became Mercury Records right Uh, but they were a major they were part of the um, so called Polygram group and they were classed as a major along with Polydor and London Records who um, were also part of the group Um, so yeah it it was great to work there you know, soon after I joined, we had Geldof and Co doing the Christmas thing. And it was, I mean, it was a major record company. There were lots of things going on within the realms of that company, different types of music. You know, on the label, we had ABC, Soft Cell, 
um, Tears for Fears. There were we had loads of great things going on in the alternative arena. Yeah, um, on the dance arena, which I was more well known for, of course. Um, we were playing. Well, we were releasing things by calling the gang cameo. Eventually, people like Shannon and stuff like that. The thing is, when I was a teenager, I loved all different kinds of music. I didn't really discover soul music till I was about 17. Oh, wow. So cool. when I went into record companies, I already had a very broad-based feel for lots and lots of music, which is why I was very, very happy to go off and work with the alternative bands as well as the um, the soul acts. Brilliant. Next track is, uh, we've got down on the list, is next track is Tina Turner. Okay. Private Dancer, brilliant tune. Okay, well, the story about this is that um, certainly in the 80s, uh, my experience at Phonogram and later at A&M, the massive superstar artists hardly ever came into the building. You right. Know, they, they kind of did what they liked, and the management would come in and sort them out and, and do all their business for them. But out of the blue, uh, one day I got a call from one of the label managers. He said, Mark Knopfler's here. Will you come and see him? And I said, yeah, sure. So I popped down and saw Mark. And I was still kind of well known as a bit of a soul boy in the building. And um, Knopfler said to me, look, I've got this song um, and I want a black female vocalist to sing it. And he said, have you got any suggestions? And I said, well, I don't know. I'll go and have a listen. So I cleared off and had a listen to this song. And um, a couple of days later... He was back. And I saw him in the court. I said, oh, I've got a suggestion for your song. And he said, oh, uh, it's all right. I've already given it to Tina Turner. And I said, oh, OK, well, that makes a lot of sense. And um, the song was Private Dancer. And, of course, I said to him, I'm not being funny. Why can't you sing this? And he said, well, halfway through, there's a line that just makes me laugh. And I just can't sing it. So I want to give it to somebody else. So Tina Turner was the artist that got Private Dancer. Amazing. And I think I was going to say to him, I think you should give it to Gladys Knight. So, um, oh, that would have been good. Yeah, I think that, that, might, that might have fit. Can you remember the line that you felt No, the no. line, the, I can't remember. It was a random line in the middle of a verse. And and for and I, when I got the lyrics, I was looking at it thinking, why can't he sing this? But it obviously, you know, got him somewhere along the line Amazing. and he had to pass it on. Just, um, just before we get into the next track, which is ABC, yeah, um, so you were known as an A and R man, is yeah. this right? What does that mean, Jeff? Well, basically, I started in promotion, right, which speaks for itself. You're running around trying to get people to play your records, okay? You know, in whatever genre, whatever way you can. Um, but A and R, you're dealing directly with the artists. Um, you're working with them, the management. Uh, if they're making a record, you're working with the producer of the record, and you're very, very much involved in the creative process for those artists um, and you know in a nutshell that's it really so the artists are signed already the, the artists are signed yeah you might sign some of them I mean I did sign a couple which I'll come to talk about okay yeah um, right. and, but there are other times um, for example somebody might leave and therefore they've got a couple of acts that need looking after and the door would open and my boss would come in and say do you fancy working with so and so and I go yeah sure and he, and you would pick the ball up and run with it, basically. Mm -hmm. So that's that's how all that, you know, sort of comes around. How did you get into that? Was it from being a DJ? Well, or? well, no, basically, when I was in promotion at Phonogram, I kept going down to the A&R floor saying, look, I really think you should sign this, I really think you should sign that. And eventually they said, look, why don't you just come and work for us? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't going to turn it down. So um, What a great yeah, job. That's how that progressed. And yeah. this would have been early part of 80s, would it? Yeah, 81 to about 83. Wow. I was doing promotion. Then after that, I was in A&R. What time to be in the music industry as yeah, well? It was, it was amazing. It wasn't just a, such an explosion of different music. Um, there were there was innovation, you know, the CD had kind of turned up and that was turning the industry on its head more later 80s than early 80s but yeah it was it was a very very uh f excellent time to be involved in the business and know. tell me about abc and this song okay well abc was one of those artists that i was asked if i could work with and i said yeah of course i always loved abc and when i was strolling around those student clubs in the uh, uh around 81 82 tears uh, are not enough was being played by everybody and then of course trevor horn uh, worked with them on um, 
uh, their a debut album. And um, Martin had been ill and he was getting over his illness. Uh, he was still with Mark, uh, Mark Wyatt. The rest of the band had gone and they were writing songs and coming in saying, oh, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And then one day um, they came in and they played me a demo of When Smokey Sings. And it was like, wow, this is it. Thank you so much. And uh, off we went to record the album. Uh, they did the uh, half the album with Bernard Edwards from Chic. We did that in London. And they produced the other half themselves. And it was an instant yes, was it, from you? Oh, crikey, yeah, yeah. Even in demo form, you couldn't miss it. It was uh, The lyrics are fantastic, as Martin's lyrics always are. Uh, they put this fantastic sort of faux Motown feel around the whole track. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was just a superb... Uh, piece of music and this it goes without saying this is a tribute to Smokey Robinson oh absolutely track, yeah it? yeah yeah absolutely and they they uh, name check other artists during the uh, song but yeah it's all about Smokey initially all right uh, it's so great that you've picked you've put Stevie Wonder on the list he, okay. with the other guests we've had he comes up you know maybe once or twice but I, I always think more people should include Stevie Wonder yeah. in, you know, like a pivotal list of the 80s. Tell me, have you ever met him? I must ask well, you. Well, okay, this is the whole story. Um, basically, I was working with a chap in the UK who had connections to Stevie. And amazingly, Stevie had kept coming across talent as he would do in his position, and he decided he wanted a record label of his own. And my contact, Keith Harris, who's well known in the um, UK record business, said to me, do you fancy signing Stevie Wonder's label? And, well, I could have, you know, I'd have bitten his hand off if he'd have held it out in front of me. So um, Stevie came to our office one day with a couple of people and played us a load of songs, told us what he wanted to do with the label. And then I uh, had to start going to LA to see him. And... Um, I'm sure you've all heard about Wonder Time. You know, Stevie's not a nine-to-five guy. He just does things when he wakes up and it works for him. So quite often I'd be in LA and you get a call at three in the morning, four in the morning, Stevie's coming down. This is to his studio, Wonderland. Come down now. So you drive off down the valley and go to Wonderland and he'd turn up and you could chat with him and, and uh, you know, join in with his musicians and all wow. this sort of stuff. But what happened was we had an, an agreement for the deal, but we couldn't get it signed. And so um, I went off to L.A. to see his lawyer and uh, his lawyer made me meet him in a car park. <laughs> and it was it was a bit it was a bit like wacky races. It was like this car park was falling to bits. It wasn't the average multi-story car park. And he was a bit of a character, Stevie's lawyer. He pulled up in this beaten up old uh, sports car. He got out of his car. He had a sweatshirt on. I swear he had half his lunch down the front of the sweatshirt. <laughs> Gosh. And uh, then he, out of the blue, he said, oh, how's it going? A bit of small talk. And then he said, we're not signing this deal. And I said, well, why? And he said, because I know what Stevie's like. If we sign this deal, he'll spend all his money on it, and I'm not letting that happen. And I went, mm, OK, fair enough. So my chance to work any more with Stevie Wonder ended in a car park in Los Angeles. <laughs> and that was it. And that was it. <laughs> yeah, I've actually got a copy of the deal at home in a file. Wow, amazing. So, um, yeah, but it was it was amazing being around him. Mm. And, I was going to um, ask you what that was like. A few people have said he's he was almost, he's almost otherworldly. Yeah, he is. Talent. I mean, I, I had one example where um, he came into a room and there were about five or six of us and I hadn't had a chance to tell him I was there. And somebody said something funny, and we all laughed, and he immediately pointed towards me and said, who's that? And I said, oh, it's Jeff Young, Steve. He went, oh, hi, how are you? Didn't know you were in the room. I'm like, yeah, yeah, no problem. And, um, yeah, he had he had that thing that they say about blind people, that extra special hearing thing that they have. Yeah. Um, and his engineer played me a couple of tracks from an album he was due to release, and they were pretty firing. And it was I was in an immensely privileged position in that period and the album that came out um uh after i'd finished you know trying to get the label deal done was characters mm. and uh with each beat of my heart was a track off the album this is a beautiful track and the backing vocals yeah oh amazing yes yeah, aren't they yeah absolutely okay lovely lovely great story um we're gonna focus on 1987 next yeah. was not was 1987 big year for you particularly big year for you wasn't it absolutely well uh october 87 was when i first started the big beat the radio one dance show and um it was a bit weird because the year before i'd started going to new york for the first time 
and I was absolutely amazed at what New York radio was like in comparison to what was going on in the UK. What was the difference? Well, you'd have you'd have maybe uh, a pop st- you'd have a pop station that was a pop nine to f- well nine till midnight whatever Monday yeah. to Friday, then Friday night it would turn into a dance station until Sunday night when it would turn back into a pop station. And the music was absolutely amazing. All kinds of different DJs on there doing mixes and uh, playlist shows with all kinds of music on. I think there was even a rock station that used to do it. It used to turn itself into a dance station at the weekend. Anyway, I came back and I kept thinking about how we didn't have anything like this in the UK. There were pirate stations There were shows on individual local stations, but there wasn't a national station. So this is pre-computer and everything. So I hand-wrote a three-page letter to Johnny Beerling, who was head of Radio 1, didn't hear a thing, and then out of the blue in September of that year, they suddenly said, we want to do it. And the lucky thing about it was... I was in two minds, believe it or not, because of Medium Wave. They were on Medium Wave at the time. And Medium Wave at night, for anyone who's tried it, is just a no-go. But they told me they were about to go FM. They, they were rolling out their FM between you know October and Christmas. So that gave Radio 1 a new lease of life at night. Obviously, mine was a nighttime program. It started at 7 and went on till um, 10, usually, although mm. the end time changed a couple of times. Um, so yeah, it was it was fantastic, and again, it was a great time for different music. You know, the whole the whole thing of um, independent bands had kind of fallen away, and a lot of the great independent music that was coming out at the time was dance. Mm. I know you've spoken to Mark Moore, for example. People like Mark were making great music, and it was being released on independent labels, um, and it was a great time. So. That whole thing in 87 was one of the early periods where DJs weren't necessarily relying on everything from America Mm -hmm. because we never had a great dance culture much before then. Um, So that that was a sea change. And And the great thing I always said about dance, you know, it wasn't just a phase. Dance turned up and never left the building. Um because it evolved into the whole era of super clubs and all this sort of thing in the 90s and the superstar DJs. So, it, you know, once the dance ball arrived, it just kept rolling. So can you give me, can you remember a couple of tracks you played on that first show or within the first couple of months? Well, the reason I chose Was Not Was uh, is that it's the first record I played on the programme. Wow. And again, they were signed to Phonogram, so I knew them. <clears throat> and they were really great guys. They spent a lot of time in the UK for an American act. And um, I went on to remix some of their stuff, Spy in the House of Love, I remixed. And um, a year after I did it, it went to number one in the Billboard charts, dance charts. So that was quite good. Um, but the the interesting thing about the Radio 1 thing, it, I had a not trouble, but I had a bit of persuading to do for them to try and tell them that what I wanted to do as a program wasn't what they usually do for a program so the first thing they wanted me to do was have loads of chart records in the program and loads of this and loads of that and as i was so new in the building i couldn't just turn around and go listen you've all you can all clear off i'm not having any of this (laughs) so did you have to play ball to begin with yeah a little bit um and then for various reasons i got more and more head to do what i wanted to do and stuff but it was incredible i was working with this producer and he was desperate for me to play Walk the Dinosaurs, the first tune on the show. And I was trying to say to him, look, I I can't do that because it's on the label that I work for (laughs) and I know them and I I just can't do it. No, 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 it's in the charts. we got to start with it. So I just went, you know what, we'll do it. And uh, I know that a lot of people in the business who are still in their offices at seven that night, when it came on and... It was Walk the Dinosaur was the first thing. I know there was a lot of laughing and, oh, my God, stuff going on, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, but I did love the band. I thought the band were fantastic. Don and David was wrote absolutely fantastic lyrics and uh, they wrote great pop songs as well as some of the, the more obscure things that they did as well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. So there we are. Was Br- not was. Brilliant stuff. Brilliant yeah. stuff. We, when we talk about uh, the radio show, just to just to kind of recap, if people don't know, well, my regular listening as a thirteen-year-old kid when I got a stereo stack system was you on a Friday night. Pete Tong did a show called the Soul Session, I think, I'm not on sure. Capital. I'm not sure what he called it actually. 
It was yeah. like on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah. But you, the, the pair of you, I, mean, I was lucky enough to be a London boy, um, I got to know all the exclusive records, you know, months and months before they come out. And yeah. uh, with this next track that you've asked uh, to, to pick, Della Soul, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, correct me if I'm wrong, mm. you broke them, didn't you? Did you break them in the UK? Yeah, I think so. I think I had a big hand in it, of course, being the national station, and they would give you th- records a couple of weeks early, so you, you had a couple of weeks ahead of people and there's nothing like it for DJs if they can't get a record that they want they all go absolutely mental so the best thing to do is make it scarce <laughs> so um so yeah a day la soul you know they that album 3 feet high and rising it mm. was kind of the the arrival of the the super sampling era if you like because hip hop always you know used various very clever samples but uh, day la soul took it to another level and um, it was a fantastic album within your time just to go back on the Big Beat show sure you must have that was such a pivotal few years wasn't it in dance music you must have broken so many different kind of styles of dance music the summer of 88 you were on air every Friday night and that was obviously you know the prelude to the Acid House thing coming up okay Acid House was already kind of there um and I have to admit, uh, when I first started the Big Beat, I played quite a few of the Acid House records, um, but then I kind of got mixed up between the fact that I was doing a radio show and I was doing a radio show for clubs, and I and I probably didn't play as much of it as I should have done. Um, but that's okay, you know, you can look at that in hindsight and um, look at what people said about the show at the time. Um, but yeah, that that was that was kind of already there. But yeah, it did progress. It's a really clever show because if I'm right in thinking, when I used to hear it, it started off dance, and then you you kind of zoned the hip hop into yeah. an hour. Was it called National Fresh? Yeah, basically, what I did there was, um, although I absolutely loved hip hop, I was trying to integrate all these ty- different types of dance into either one hour or two hours or whatever. And in the end, I realised that I'd get a better flow of the programme if I ghettoised the hip-hop off yeah. and gave it its own hour. So within the big beat, there was National Fresh. Yeah. So um, that was how that came about. Um, it was quite funny, actually. I went to one of the guys who was um, quite high up at Radio 1 and I said to him, look, do you mind if I play all the hip-hop in the last hour of the show? And again, there was all this De La Soul stuff going on and there was loads of innovative things happening. And he said to me, do you think hip-hop will last another 10 years? <laughs> and I said, man alive, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. And although obviously over the years it progressed and you know we ended up with Gangster and God knows what else, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. That's, um, that's something I just did. And with it, just keeping a couple more questions with yeah. the radio show. Do you have a track that you're most proud of, like owning, breaking, being responsible for on that show? Yeah. Okay. Well, obviously we've talked about De La Soul. Yeah. Um, but there was one track that um, I feel particularly fond of, and that was Lisa Stansfield all around the world. Oh, okay. And and again, I'd met Lisa um, a couple of years before. And I knew she was trying to carve a a record career and stuff like this. And and, uh, I met her and her partner. And at the time, I thought they had some good songs, but they weren't quite ready. And I said to him, look, why don't you come back in a little while and we'll have another listen? Well, in the meantime, they went off and signed to Arista. And I thought that was quite a bold thing for Arista to do at the time. And I thought, well, fair play. If you can see what she's got, then brilliant. Mm. Anyway, um, she'd already been progressing towards a sound that, that all around the world had. And when they finished the record, they gave it to me on an acetate and they left it with me for two weeks. And that whole thing of making a record scarce amongst other DJs, they all want it, la, 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 la. And the record was an absolute flyer, of course. Um, But one of the things I was proud of about it, it helped launch a major career. It wasn't just a one-off dance act by a one-off artist that you're never going to hear from again, as a lot of those records were. Um, it, it it was a, a big springboard for her, so I was very pleased with that. So you you were kind of responsible for that from the kind of cold cut sound yeah. to the Lisa Stansfield beautiful soul soul sound that we know on this yeah, record. Absolutely, and the whole thing of breaking an artist long term, you know, I've got that in me from the A and R thing because when you sign an act, you want to help it develop and you want to see it grow and have longevity. That's the whole point of, yeah. the, of the process. Um, so yeah, help, trying to, helping Lisa 
I, I was really pleased to be able to do that. You must be uh, really proud of Big B. I know that there are still fan clubs on social media and people still post old, your old shows from like 88, 89. Yeah, there is a there is a Big Beat um, Facebook page. Yeah. And there are other little bits and pieces where you can find Yeah, I am really proud of it. And I've got to be honest, I didn't really realise how big it was until years later when... You know, I might be travelling or something, particularly in Scotland and places like that. People would just come up to me and go, oh, man, that show was just unbelievable. And I remember being at a gig uh, at Barrowlands. Um, it was all part of a Yamaha competition uh, for new bands. And I went for a, a walk um, just down this street where Barrowlands was, and it was full of chip shops and whatever, you know. And as I'm walking down the street, um, it was a Friday night, I realised every shop in the street has got the show on. And wow. I, and I was like, well, this is interesting. And, of course, unless you go out there or somebody makes a point of telling you, you've got no idea this is going on. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think the show was pretty big everywhere. When I say except London, I think Radio 1, no matter what they had at that time, was never going to be hip in London. But for the rest of the country, it was a bit of an eye-opener. And just one more, I suppose, anoraki question yeah. that I haven't heard you talk about before. People go, you you were the original Pete Tong. Oh. You, you you and Pete, like, have always known each other, haven't you? Yeah, of course, and you yeah. were kind of responsible for Pete starting the Essential Selection, weren't you? Um, well, basically, Pete was on uh, Radio Kent at was the he? time. Wow. Yeah, when I was on Radio London. Yeah. So when I left Radio London to... Um, uh, well, actually, I left Radio London to go to Capital. And um, I said to Radio London, look, get Pete Tong off Radio Kent and get him up here. So they did. And, of course, I'm talking to Pete all the time because we were mates. And basically, I'd accepted a job at Capital. And out of the blue, a couple of weeks before I started at Capital, Radio One finally rang and said, will you do a show for us? So I had to ring Capital and say, <laughs> I'm leaving when I hadn't even started. That's cool. <laughs> Richard Park wasn't too I'm chuffed, sure I promise that. you. And he said to me, what should I do? And I just said, well, get Pete Tong. So Tong was on Radio London for like six weeks and then he found himself on Capital. Wow. So that's how that... And then when I, when I left the Big B in late 90... Well, right at the very end of 91, same thing happened with... Radio One, you know, they said to me, what do you think we should do? And I said, well, get Pete Tong. Mm -hmm. um, and there we are, yeah. I what mean, do, what that, do you that, think about his, you know, his success in well, the I 90s think it, and what I think he's been brilliant. I mean, I think even he would say he's, he's amazed he's not been um, pulled up by the age police yet, um, but he's still doing, his, doing the business and it's great. And I think the concerts are, are fantastic. You know, he's still involved. He's got a record label. He's still involved with various artists on, on various projects. And I think that's brilliant. You know, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do joke with people. I was Pete Tong before he was. <laughs> but you know what? It's all good. Brilliant stuff. All right, enough anoraki questions. We're going to go it's into okay. uh, Squitty Polissi. Okay, this is basically uh, a favourite of mine. I always liked Scritty, even in the early 80s when they were doing, um, well, you know, their, their records with great songs on. Yeah, um, but obviously when he met Gamson and and, it, and evolved the sound, it became a lot more electronic and stuff. And I was and I've always absolutely adored Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. And um, Miles was going through an inter interesting period because all of a sudden he'd started to do covers of pop songs, which nobody expected. I know he uh, he did Time After Time, and there was another. Oh, he did uh, Human Nature, and for some reason I know, I know that he liked Green. And um, they, I think they approached him and he said, yeah, I'd love to play on one of your songs. And um, they released Opahetti with this uh, wonderful solo. I mean, on the album version, it's great because the solo is very, very long. The 45, obviously, the solo's uh, a bit um, uh, shorter. Yeah. But, yeah, th this is a scritty song I've always this loved. This is so beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Such a beautiful yeah. track. Yeah, and, again, I think Gamson's production and... Everything on it is is absolutely superb. Yeah, the summer of '88. This was this is the perfect sound of that summer, isn't yeah, it? Amazing yeah, amazing stuff. Um, you got a story about Texas, haven't you? I was still in A and R at Phonogram, and I was working with a band called Hipsway, Scottish band, and they did pretty well. We put this album out; it, it went silver. We had a few hits off it. They they 
did okay in America with it. And um, I think we were looking forward to making a second album and they decided they wanted to split up. So they split up. Uh, and the bass player was um, Johnny McElhone, who'd already been in Altered Images. And Johnny went off um, and did some demos with a young lady and came back to me and I said, well, you know, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to do this with you. And um, we set up um, to do, I think, four or five songs, and maybe not the whole album, but certainly half of it, with, with a really well-known producer. And uh, the band took off to L.A., and it didn't work at all. The whole thing collapsed. They had to come home. And shortly afterwards, I left the company to go to A&M. And it took them um, about a year to kind of regroup and find a producer who they really wanted to work with. And that producer was Tim Palmer. Of course, the, um, uh, the female vocalist on it was Charlene Spateri. And she's had an amazing career. And the song that, that they played me on on their demo tape that I thought, well, this is a smash, was I Don't Want a Lover. Right. That was their first hit single, wasn't that it? That was the first hit single, yeah. And Am it, I right? And it, it came out over a year after I'd left the company. Oh, so, wow. So, okay. so that's why I left the company uh, at the end of 87 and the, uh, the uh, single didn't come out till 89. Okay, wow. Which is that time it took them to kind of regroup and think about what they were doing and I think um, you know they started adding more guitars to what they were doing over that period so it was quite good because that period where they were regrouping gave them a chance to develop a bit more as well as a band can you remember what you thought when you first heard Charlene's vocals yeah it was it was great and um, I mean she I think she was still a teenager when Johnny did the original demos with wow. her for the I band I heard she was hairdressing yeah you she know, was yeah I mean you, you've got talk sport up here yeah she used to cut Jim White's hair <laughs> in Glasgow <laughs> no way yeah seriously yeah you couldn't make that up could no you? you couldn't really no, no that's funny incredible yeah. just I've got a quick a couple of like quick fire questions as far sure. as um, you know your career in the uh, in the, the record industry um, what's the track that you're most proud proud of signing oh wow or the band that you're most pr proud of giving well, a chance? I think, I think Texas is is one of them, again, because they went on to have such a long career. You know, quite often bands last one or two albums. I mean, you never know when you sign a band how long they're going to last for. Some of them are five minutes, some of them are five years, you know, not many of them are 25, 30 years. Um, so Texas will be one of them. Um, I think I'd stay with that. Texas. Yeah. Any that got away? <sighs> well, I'll tell you what. There's a vocalist called Lance Ellington who um, a few years ago was the vocalist on the Strictly band. He was he was singing with Strictly. Right. And uh, I made an album with him at A&M and we did it with um, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis's engineer at Flight Time wow. in Minneapolis and that was a great experience. Um, but we couldn't, we couldn't break the album. And years later, I had people say to me, oh, that album was before its time and all sorts of other stuff. I'd love to have done another record with Lance, but it never, it never happened. But So I think he was possibly one that got away. I saw him as being a UK version of Alexander O'Neill. And, um, yeah, that was one of the reasons I think we, we tore off to flight time in America to get that sound. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I think, um, yeah... That's 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 another one. My my final one is: Do you have a favourite kind of zone of time uh, where you go? That was the like the golden era, if you want. That was where it was at. Well, I think um, it would have to be that whole eighty four, eighty five through to ninety three period for me personally. Although obviously, as we've discussed, club culture kept expanding and delivering and innovating well through the 90s but for me personally that period was the was the was the golden period i'm going to chuck in one more question what's your career highlight career highlight wow i guess i guess the radio one show um and uh, and having lots of lots of hits with lots of different artists across three record companies yeah, that's that's it really. Amazing legacy. Thank you. Yeah, incredible.
I'm really chuffed you're doing this today. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's amazing right. to... You know, like kind of when you meet someone, like one of your heroes. I know that we've hung out before and I've met yeah. your radius, but to actually have an hour to chat with you about this stuff is a big tick. So no, thank, thank you. you. Thank no, you pleasure. so much. Pleasure. Um, we're going to go to the final track, Stone Roses. Yeah. Well, Force Gold. I, I chose this because, again, it's another favourite. And as we've been discussing, club culture um, was, um, in, when I say improving, expanding. Um, the gigs themselves, um, certainly from where I came from before Radio 1, the gigs were normally about black music. It would normally be, you know, soul, jazz, a, a little bit of hip-hop, whatever. But as club culture expanded and a lot of that stuff got left behind, um, the band started to, when I say make a comeback, you know, in the late 80s, more bands were doing dance orientated things. And of course, you know, we all remember the Mondays and the farm, but one of the early ones was Fool's Gold, Stone Roses. You know, they had this double A side single that came out on Silvertone and they were one of the first acts that kind of got played in dance venues and they were a band, if you see what I mean, rather than a Mark Moore or whoever. Yeah. You know, um, some so kind like of real instrument. Yeah, some kind of rave record out of America. And so, yeah, they, they kind of forged the way for bands such as them to, um, to get involved in club culture and be played at those fantastic events. You used to DJ as well, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Uh, what were clubs like? Can you take me back to, like, 88, 89? It must have been a really exciting uh, time with so many styles of music coming through. Yeah, it was. I mean, I have to admit, me, uh, me personally, I was still kind of classed as more of a, a, a DJ from the, the soul community. So I didn't necessarily get into that whole... I mean, rave is such a terrible word, but that rave arena, I never really got involved in that. Mm -hmm. um, Are you glad about that? Uh, no, I no, I would have loved to have been involved in it. Um, you know, I, I, well, in the 90s, I went to lots of different gigs. Um, at one point in the 90s, um, I was involved in a radio production company with Pete, and um, we had The Essential Mix as one of our programmes. Because was, you set that up, that was your idea, wasn't it? No, no, it was Eddie Gordon's idea. The Essential Mix was Eddie Gordon's idea, but Pete kept being asked by Matthew Bannister at Radio 1 to do more programmes, and Pete said, well, why don't, why don't you let us create a, a, a company and we'll deliver more programmes? Yeah. And that was Pete's way of getting out of having to do the programmes himself. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, we did that, and as part of the Essential Mix, we used to go out and do live broadcasts once a month from different clubs around the country, different DJs, and then it was our company that said to Radio 1 for the first time, you should go to Ibiza. Oh, wow. So we took them to Ibiza for the first time, and... Um, that was a game-changer, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, I think. Yeah, it was. And um, the first two years, uh, we, we just took um, the handful of DJs that were doing dance shows on Radio 1, you know, Danny Rampling... Um, Jules, uh, Pete, obviously. Uh, we did that for a couple of years. And then on year three, that was the year Radio 1 went mental and decided to take everybody. <laughs> and so, you know, it, you know Moyles went, uh, everybody went, you know. Yeah. Uh, Zoe Ball. Um, and, yeah, they, they never, when I say they never looked back, I think they had to rein it in the year <laughs> yeah. after. They, they were losing DJs around the island for there various reasons. There was that famous reasons. Lisa Anson Well, thing, that, that's there? why, yeah, yeah. God, God knows what, what she ingested, but... <laughs> I think they found her wandering up some country lane a day later or something. Very you distressed. Know. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Not a good look for sure. But um, yeah. yeah, no. And and they're still going. Of course, they're still going to yeah. Ibiza. Yeah. So that's good. Do you guys get together much? So you got like you know you Pete Tong, your Westwood, your Jules's, your you know Seb Fontaine's, chucking it. Do you have Christmas get together? No. <laughs> no. Some of the others do, but I don't. I mean, sometimes I come across them in business or something. Yeah. You know, Jules when he's not not DJing he's a lawyer wow. and the last time I saw him I had a meeting with something um, to do with um, uh, oh what do they call it oh IP yeah and um, so we chatted about that I, I kind of correspond with Pete every now and again you know he's still a busy lad um, and then you just bump into guys every now and again um, whether it be Norman 
or whoever. Yeah. You know? So, um, yeah, we don't necessarily ring each other up and have a Christmas party. <laughs> <laughs> and you're retired now, aren't you, Jeff? Yeah, yeah, I've retired so, in do, March of last year. What does that mean? Because obviously having a passion for music and DJing, does it ever die? Not really. I mean, since I've retired, the only thing that... Um, I've found difficult is finding time to listen to the amount of music that I used to have to listen to for my Jazz FM show, which was the last radio show that I did. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I've got a little note on my phone. Whenever I see something, I think I should check that out. I just tap it into the phone, and if I can, while I'm driving, I might go on the Spotify and try and check these things out. Yeah. I, st- I mean, I bought a batch of CDs the other day. You know, my wife said to me, "What are you doing?" <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I just like them in the car, you know. So I'm so still, never I'm still a bit, you. yeah. No, I'm still a bit old school like that, you know. I have to, for certain artists, I still have to have a little bit of physical stuff, you know. And do I've, I'm dying to ask you this question: Do you have like a massive closet of records? Okay, well, I used to. I used to have a massive closet of records. I did get rid of um, quite a few, really, that really weren't doing anything. Like all those old acetates and stuff. Oh, so, yeah, I've still, got, I've still got quite a lot of that kind of stuff. Okay. But, you know, I got rid of hundreds of 12s, which are basically a 12-inch of an album track that I've got on the album, which is on the other side of the room. <laughs> so it was like it just didn't make sense. No. And I was doing more and more shows using CD and files and whatever. So I had my shelves halved. So instead of them racked up with 12s, they were racked up with CDs. Yeah. So um, that's what I did with that. But, yeah, I, I packed up uh, last March. Well, can I just say thank you so much for coming in. and Pleasure. You know, me being here is partly responsible, you know, the fact that I used to listen to you and you influenced me so much. So it's so cool to meet you well, and spend this hour chatting with you. Thanks, Steve. That's very kind of you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Jeff. Thanks a lot.